welcome again to Valente Brothers TV. This time we're together here at Valente Brothers headquarters in North Miami Beach, Florida. And we're going to talk about something very, very important, which is the philosophy of Jiu Jitsu. Throughout the years, we have learned both through history and through our recent um, memory in Brazil, the problem that can occur if Jiu Jitsu is taught disconnected from its philosophy. So Pedro, talk to us a little bit about this very important issue. You know, growing up, I experienced this because when I was a teenager, Jiu Jitsu actually had a very bad reputation in Brazil. And actually, a lot of the parents of friends of mine, when they found out that I practiced Jiu Jitsu, sometimes they looked at me in a bad eye, with a bad image. And all because there were people misusing Jiu Jitsu in the streets. And at that point, I realized that Jiu Jitsu is not always a force of good. That depending on the way it is taught, it can be good, it can be amazing, it can have an amazing transformative benefit for the person who's practicing. But if it's not taught the right way, it can also work the other way. And it can be a force of negative behavior. And we, we witnessed this in Brazil. A lot of the people sometimes, a lot of Jiu Jitsu instructors, were in disbelief and many times they couldn't really understand what was happening but I was a teenager and I many times witnessed in, bir in birthday parties, in social events, Jiu Jitsu practitioners being disrespectful towards women, drinking in an exaggerated way, using drugs, picking fights, being cowards towards other people, really creating a mess many times and this really, really hurt the reputation of Jiu-Jitsu for many, many years in Brazil, and it was a very serious problem. At that time, uh, my father wrote an article for a very big Brazilian newspaper, and one of the things that he said in that article is that the secret to Jiu-Jitsu, the secret to, to the art, is to understand and follow the philosophy. And that's what we believe in, that the philosophy has a very important role for, so that people can learn Jiu-Jitsu and use it in a positive way. Talk to us a little bit about the history, even in Japan, going as far as Japan, of how maybe there are some very good examples of what can happen if the philosophy is not present in the instruction of Jiu Jitsu. Yes, Jiu Jitsu begins, the roots of Jiu Jitsu are uh, with the warrior class, the warrior class in Japan. Japan had a caste system and you had a different um, different classes in society. You had the merchants, you had the warriors, you have the, the noble class. And the warriors were actually very cultured. They were educated and they considered themselves of the highest uh, moral character and people who had a huge responsibility in carrying a tradition. A tradition that they felt was very important for Japan as a nation. And the knowledge of jiu-jitsu was something that they treated with the utmost respect and something that was not taught to everyone. It was only taught within the clans, from grandfather to father to son, and they understood that this was a deadly weapon that had to be taught with great responsibility. With the changes that occurred in Japan um, between the, the 19th and the 20th centuries and the Meiji period being established, uh, Jiu-Jitsu changed because a lot of uh, people were no longer interested in learning Jiu-Jitsu because they associated Jiu-Jitsu with the old Japanese ways and they wanted to become more westernized. So Jiu-Jitsu in many ways fell in disrepute in Japan and the reputation of Jiu-Jitsu was greatly tarnished. Um, it was associated with thuggery, it was associated with street fighting, and so Jiu-Jitsu actually developed a very bad name and a very bad reputation in, in Japanese society. And even though the philosophy had already been something that was part of Jiu-Jitsu for many, many years, that element was lost to the point that Jigoro Kano, he, who was a Jiu-Jitsu practitioner, Jiu-Jitsu teacher, he took the art and he changed its name because he felt that the name Jiu-Jitsu was, had a very bad image attached to it. And so he decided to give it the name Judo and create something that was connected with a philosophy. He, he called it Judo, which is Do means way, as a way of life and not just a fighting technique. Well, Jiu-Jitsu 
back in the day through Grandmaster Elio, through the Gracie brothers, Carlos and Elio, the original Gracie Academy. It was taught mostly, many people don't know this, but it was taught mostly in private classes. The group class instruction was done more maybe for training sessions and sparring sessions that happened within the advanced students of the school. So what happened? How was that transition? How maybe that transition impacted the current culture of Jiu-Jitsu? Grandmaster Carlos Gracie learned Jiu-Jitsu from a Japanese master, Mitsuyo Maeda. And he obviously, when he was involved with Mitsuyo Maeda, he witnessed the Japanese traditions and the Japanese customs that go with the art. However, many things happened during that time. Number one, um, Japan in the 1940s, the 30s and 40s, was uh, a member of the Nazi coalition. They were associated with, uh, they were connected with Italy and, and Germany. And so the Gracies at the time did not want to associate themselves with the Japanese customs. Also, as you said very well, their classes were taught privately. And so in a private environment, you don't need a lot of those formalities that are so necessary in a group class. So they, since they were only teaching private classes, pretty much they didn't use the bowing and some of the etiquette that were associated with jiu-jitsu and, and with the martial arts. When, once again, group classes started to be used and, and people started practicing jiu-jitsu, especially as the tournaments came about and they wanted to train together and, and, and create group classes, also for ec economical reasons, to be able to make jiu-jitsu more accessible to people. They kind of, many schools, kind of utilized the informal ways that were um, used in the private classes, they used those same ways in the group class. And so that, in many, many times, created a, a more disorganized environment. There was less organization, less respect, less manners, and that can be very dangerous. Because since we're teaching something that, that, that is actually life and death, you're teaching choking techniques, you're teaching joint breaking techniques. So when you teach something without the right discipline, without the, the right level of, of respect. And it's not just about bowing. It's about posture. It's about making sure that um, bad language is not used. Uh, the military, for example. In the military, they don't use oriental customs, but still, still is an atmosphere of respect, an atmosphere that leads to good behavior and doesn't accept a type of behavior that can be conducive towards activities that are incompatible with such uh, techniques of great danger and, and, and great value um, for self-defense. Well, talk to us a little bit about how we took part in trying to change that and adapt that when we came to the United States. Because what we see through history, not just in Japan, but through what happened in Brazil, we lived through the time which you brought up moments ago where jiu-jitsu, and it's still today, even though there has been great work done by even parts of the media in Brazil to change that, jiu-jitsu in Brazil, maybe for the surprise of most of our viewers, jiu-jitsu comes from Brazil, it's Brazilian jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu from Brazil, from Rio de Janeiro, with the beautiful history. The truth is that for a lot of people in Brazil, jiu-jitsu is seen as a negative activity. I actually had a mother come in last week and she said, oh, you guys teach jiu-jitsu here from Brazil? And she said, you know, I don't really want my, my kids to train jiu-jitsu because, you know, jiu-jitsu is too aggressive and too violent and I don't want to bring that about, you know, with my kids and I don't want to create any type of aggressiveness or violence with my kids. And I had to explain to her our method, our system, and as she, she watched our class, then she liked what she saw and she, she signed them up, but she came in with that um, negative image from, that she brought with her from Brazil. Exactly, and, and, and I think that over the, the years since we established our school, we have been very successful in creating a very positive atmosphere. I think everyone who has had the opportunity to visit one of our schools, they can see that it is an atmosphere of respect, 
of knowledge, of friendship, but with organization and with a very good um, environment for learning without any negativity. But we also feel that we're teaching jiu-jitsu. And I think it's time for us to try to influence the community with some positive ideas towards adding back the philosophy, the right philosophy, because I think there's also a little bit of confusion in regards to what is the philosophy in jiu-jitsu. So talk to us a little bit about how we've been doing that. And Yeah, you know, what, what you just said made, makes me think about when I first started teaching jiu-jitsu back in 1993 when I came from Brazil to study at the University of Miami. Um, and Royce had his amazing victories in the first UFC. And so there was a huge demand for jiu-jitsu in America. And I had been prepared by Grandmaster Elio to teach. And, and I was excited about uh, bringing jiu-jitsu and presenting jiu-jitsu to the people of Miami, in Miami. And one thing that I was worried about, very worried, is about the fact that I might teach jiu-jitsu to someone who might use it in a criminal way, in a violent way. And that was a huge responsibility for me, being a young person and, and, and very concerned about my actions and the result of my actions. I wanted to make sure, I was worried about, what if I teach somebody a choke and they use that, that choke to, to rape, they use that choke to kill, they use that choke in a cowardly way. What if I teach an arm lock and they use that arm lock to break somebody's arm in a way that's not right? And I was very concerned. But one thing that I realized throughout the years is that if you teach jiu-jitsu in an atmosphere of respect, with good manners, and setting an example of rectitude, of honesty, of benevolence, of generosity towards the students. You create an atmosphere in the school where people have to stand a certain way when you're teaching the technique. They have to sit on the mat in a certain way. They are not allowed to use any type of bad words. You only talk about positive things. You talk about health. You set, as an instructor, you set an example to the students of healthiness. When you create this type of environment, then thugs and criminals who come in, they don't stay. They don't feel comfortable. Either they change and they allow themselves to benefit from all the transformative effects of jiu-jitsu, or they leave. And many times they leave because they just cannot feel comfortable in such a clean and um, positive atmosphere. Because you don't learn jiu-jitsu in two or three days. It takes time, it takes hard work, it takes ethics. And so, People are not able to last. They, they might come in with bad intentions. Let me go there and learn some moves so I can use it in a criminal way. But once they realize that it's, it's going to take time and they're going to have to dedicate themselves and they're going to have to be part of this clean atmosphere, they usually give up or, to our happiness, they start changing. You know, we have a student who actually has been with us for many years and he's a great guy, but he had a very rough upbringing. And you know, he might have even been involved with gangs and in the street, you know, learning from the street and, and that type of thing. And when he came in, he had that, you know, tough attitude. And so, throughout the, his classes and, and his experience with us, he started changing in many ways. And one day he turned to us and he said, look, I love coming to your school because it feels like I'm in church. It feels like this is the best time of my week. And why did he say church, even though we by no means are, are a religion or have any type of religious uh, pretensions? We are a, a, a jiu-jitsu school. Um, why did he say that? Because he feels that it's a place where we promote good. We promote a good sign. We promote good actions. We promote a positive attitude, we promote good deeds, we promote a life through moral virtue, we promote healthiness, we promote emotional control, on top of teaching the most effective and most powerful system of self-defense in the world. So without even having Grandmaster Elio's book, Gracie Jiu Jitsu book right now here, maybe also a lot of viewers don't know, but Grandmaster Elio, when he awarded his professorship his professor's diploma, 
he emphasized in the grading of the students that took that professor's course, he, award, he, he, he graded qualities, virtues, outside of the mat. So talk to us just so that we can also leave a message to our viewers and an incentive also to look for Grandmaster Edu's book, study it, read it, and learn about those virtues and possibly start using those virtues in the instruction of your classes. Absolutely. So let's test you a little bit, see if you remember some of them, <laughs> just so that we can inspire our viewers to to, to want to learn more than just the arm lock, the triangle, the choke, the defense against the different attacks. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't memorize all the, all the different criteria that he had, all the virtues. But I can tell you that the first one was courage. That was a very important uh, virtue for him. For that reason, we have this symbol in our kimono. It's the, one of the seven virtues of Bushido, uh, Yu in Japanese. It uh, stands for, for courage, um, and not just physical courage, but moral courage as well. Courage to do what is right. But the second one is helpfulness. And he really believed in that balance between being courageous, always ready to do what is right, no matter what it is, even if it means that you're going to put your life on the line, you're ready to do it and you have that Courage is the fuel that allows you to always do what is right, even when you want to do something else. Courage to fight a big opponent, to represent Jiu-Jitsu, and to prove that Jiu-Jitsu had a great ability to teach the weaker the opportunity that he had to fight bigger and stronger people, but also the courage, as you said, to say no to drugs, yes. to say no to alcohol, to say no to the bad things in life. Absolutely, and, 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 and that was very important for him as you know very well. But then the balance with helpfulness, which translates to generosity. Thinking of your fellow human being, thinking of others, and having an attitude of respect towards, towards others. Some people are always surprised to see that technique was only the ninth in the list. One, two, three, technique was the ninth. Out of 10. Out of 10, and then you have a second column with 10 more. So you could say out of 20. And not the technique is not important, but moral virtues were extremely important for him. Um, he had, for him, one of the most important things was to always be honest, to always say the truth. He, always, oh, he actually had two for that. He had veracity and he had honesty. He wanted to make sure that people were um, truthful. And that requires courage as well, to always say the truth, the value of your word and standing by what you say. He also had um, hygiene. Cleanliness, that was extremely important for him, not just on the mat, but off the mat. Which is something that also helps to add a sense of discipline in training. That's something that we really, as we started teaching group classes in Miami, we were very strict about this, and especially when students came sometimes from other schools, they really had to adapt to this maybe new way that we learned from the private classes with Grandmaster Edu, from having had classes with him our whole lives and his sons, always in very clean environments. But we know, and a lot of our friends watching also, they can relate to that, that in many schools, the norm is for people to have very dirty gi, sometimes a white gi is almost gray, from the fact that it's almost a culture not to wash your and kimonos. And Grandmaster Edu sometimes wouldn't like the different kimono colors. And he would say just that, because sometimes people are not very, not very happy to wash their kimonos every class. So it's better to wear a different color, a darker color, because then the dirt doesn't show. Yeah, which, which was something <laughs> that, yeah, he did not accept. And, and as, we, as he used to tell us, um, usually when you're dirty on the, on the outside, that means you're also dirty on the inside. And so maintaining good hygiene habits is something that many times has an effect on the inside and makes you become a clean person, not just on the outside, but on the inside as well. And that was very important among other virtues. Discipline was one of them, uh, respect. All of these were part of his professor's diploma because he felt, he understood that jiu-jitsu instructors are role models for their students. You know, I, as a teenager, I had the honor and the good fortune 
of having amazing uh, role models. Um, I remember my trips to California and being with Horion and Royce uh, in the house where they had the, the Gracie garage. And I never saw a bottle of beer in their refrigerator. They never drank alcohol, they never used drugs. And I understand that people drink and they drink socially and we respect that. But those were not the role models that I had growing up. I went to their house, I saw them talking about how ripe the banana had to be in order to be eaten and for it to be healthy, about how to cut the watermelon, about good positive foods, and not just foods, but good positive deeds, helping the students in teaching jiu-jitsu. Always they were clean, always they were healthy, always trying to perfect themselves as human beings. And that was a huge impact in my life. As my jiu-jitsu teachers with Grandmaster Elio, they had this influence on all of us. And today we try to do the same thing. And let me tell you, this I think has a very, very important um, significance for teaching jiu-jitsu. Why was Grandmaster Elio so adamant about us as his representatives? Don't drink alcohol. Don't use drugs. Don't do anything that will alter your mind. Because he understood that with this weapon that jiu-jitsu is, we want to make sure to always use this weapon in a rational way, always use this weapon in a respectful way, and so we don't want to do anything that alters our mind and might take, us, take from us the ability to use this in a balanced it's and respectful like, way. It's almost like we're constantly driving. Always. When you drive, you have a weapon in your hand, the car. When you know jujutsu, you have that weapon present with you at all times. So it comes with greater responsibility. It com yes, it comes with, oh, I can't drink. Well, you can, but if you want to be a jiu-jitsu instructor under Elio Gracie's ways, not really. And the fact is that as instructors, we don't um, have the illusion that all of our instructor, all of our students, I mean, are going to stop drinking. We don't even impose that on anyone. But I think as instructors, we have the responsibility to set the right example. And even if there are instructors out there who drink, I would say never drink in front of the students. Don't give that example, because that example is one that is going to lead, because when you see bad things, criminal events, these things that I used to see in the nightclubs when I was young in Brazil, and other things that have happened in this country, where jiu-jitsu has been, has been associated with violence, Many times, I think the majority of cases, it's associated with alcohol and drugs. It's associated with illegal drugs. So, you know, I think that this is the healthiness, is the connection of jiu-jitsu with healthy living is not an accident. The fact that Grandmaster Carlos connected the jiu-jitsu that he learned from Maeda and the healthiness elements that he developed and, and what we have today in his nutritional regimen and, and, and the, 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 the concepts of, of, of healthy living that we learn connected with jiu-jitsu, they're not connected as an accident. It's for a reason. It was planned so that it helps in creating this atmosphere and this environment that will lead for people to be good and for people to do good rather than use jiu-jitsu in a bad way. Well, I think that's, that's a good start. So, and, and, and let me tell you something else. I've been very happy to see, because in the past, really, I can say that very few schools really had discipline in the way that they were conducting their classes and, and the philosophy connected and associated with the way they teach. Because, for example, in our school, we have every Friday evening, we have a philosophy class. We have a philosophy talk where we discuss the different elements in the philosophy of Jiu-Jitsu. And even in our regular classes, we always talk about the philosophy. We always talk about the important moral virtues in jiu-jitsu. Everything that really is important off the mat. And how to use what you learn on the mat, off the mat. Because it's not just about learning how to fight and thinking that just because you learn jiu-jitsu on the mat, somehow, magically, you're going to know how to use it off the mat. The instructor needs to inspire. The instructor needs to instruct so that the students learn how to use jiu-jitsu off the mat in a positive way and how to improve themselves as human beings um, through jiu-jitsu. And so 
that's why, and, and that's why I've been happy to see that a lot of different schools now are starting to talk about the philosophy of jiu-jitsu and teach classes in a more disciplined and respectful way. I think this is the right start for the future of jiu-jitsu to be bright and for us to be able to, to, to rid ourselves as the jiu-jitsu community from any um, negative image that might be associated with jiu-jitsu, not just here, but in Brazil and, and, and exactly. everywhere. And, and I think one of the main philosophical questions whenever you study philosophy is understand where we come from. And we come from a beautiful place, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, jiu-jitsu, a beautiful history that's now all over the world. It's a great sense of pride to every jiu-jitsu practitioner, every Brazilian. Jiu-jitsu now is associated to, to Brazil, just like soccer, football is. But we also need to understand that jiu-jitsu was in a, as we said, was in a negative um, view, image, had a negative image in Brazil. So, as jiu-jitsu professors and instructors and practitioners, we need to work together to not allow this to happen in the United States and consequently all over the world. And, 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 you know, and just to complement what you just said and looking back at our history and understanding our history, not just the beautiful city that where we come from, but to remember and to understand what the original Academia Grace in Rio de Janeiro was all about. The, the school was inaugurated on April 18th, 1952. And our father, he took his first class on April 27th, 1953. It's gonna be 60 years on April 27th of his first class. His instructor was Elio Vigio. In that school, they had an environment of discipline where Master Elio was the headmaster of that school. His brother Carlos gave him that, that function. And he ran that school he had a very tight ship. The operation was run with a lot of discipline and respect, and students were expected to behave with good manners, with respect, even though he was very nice to the students, and that's something that was a revolutionary approach because, you know, in many times in martial arts instructors, students were put in martial arts instruction, students were put down, students were treated in disrespectful ways, and the idea was that you had to really press the student down to his limit in order to bring out the best of him and to see if he was a warrior. Grandmaster Elio completely changed that. He believed the student had to be motivated to learn, that the idea was to raise the self-confidence and the self-esteem of the students. However, he always maintained discipline, even though they were not using the Japanese customs, even though it was mostly private classes, but my, our father always told us about that school and other people who were alive back then and took classes in, at the Gracie Academy back then in Rio, they remember that um, bad behavior was not tolerated. And so they were able to create an environment that even today everyone says that it was a breeding ground for excellence. From that school people became great doctors, great lawyers. Exactly. They, they went to every area of society and excelled in anything that they did. Our father, for example, who started training as a young teenager, he became a very successful doctor and he always attributes his success in great part to the life lessons that he learned at that original Academia Gracie from the original Gracie brothers, Grandmasters Carlos and Nelly Gracie. So, um, for many years, in many places, that philosophy got lost. People started focusing on different applications of jiu-jitsu and became too focused on different areas um, and kind of ignored others, other areas, especially the philosophical area. Our father, back in the mid-90s, when things were really out of control, he said the secret is in following the philosophy, the secret is in understanding the philosophy, and that's what we try to do here in Valente Brother, at Valente Brothers and, and, and for that reason we're extremely proud and happy of the students that we have and the way they carry on our mission and represent our school um, off the mat. Thank you very much.